Hello, coming to you from St. Martin de Porres. This is the second part to our Advent series that I'm doing, and I'm just going to dive right in and remind everybody where I left off last time. So, in the first video, I spoke about two important spiritual tools that are uh, essential for the season of Advent, and uh, that of watchfulness and joy. And I also spoke of how there's a demarcation, if you will, between the first portion of Advent and the last seven days of Advent. And I would really want to emphasize that separation now, because in the first portion of Advent, from the first Sunday of Advent until December 17th, the focus, or the primary focus, is on the second coming. Because remember, we call this the season of Advent. And Advent literally means to come, from the Latin Adventum. Ad to Ventum come. So Adventum, or Advent in English, to come. So we're focusing on the coming of the Lord. But we mean this holistically. Remember, our church is holistic in its approach to things. We are neither, we neither think of things, we never think of things in terms of either or. Rather, we always think of things in terms of both and. That is the Catholic principle. The word Catholic, Catalonon, means pertaining to the whole. So uh, a principle of Catholicity pertaining to the whole, is, is exactly that. It's a principle of wholeness. So if you look at the full picture of the Lord's coming, we can't look only at the first coming. We have to be attentive to how he is ultimately coming in glory. And so, in a fitting sense, in this season of the coming of the Lord, Advent's, we focus first and foremost in the beginning on the second coming, the second advent of the Lord. As a point of meditation here, I want us to remember that although from our vantage point, the second advent is in the distance, so to say, it is in the future for us. From God's vantage point, it is in the present. God is present to all things. For God to be eternal is for is to perceive all moments from every possible angle in the same instance. That is what eternity is. It's when a being encompasses every aspect of something from every angle in every possible instance. That's what eternity is. Only God is capable of that. And for us, we're merely entering into that experience. Well, if we keep that in mind, that everything is present to God, that means that the second coming is present to God already. From the divine vantage point, it's as if there is only one advent, one coming. Yes, he comes as man. He returns to the Father in glory, risen from the dead. And then he returns in glory, right? He returns uh, back to the earth, back to this creation in glory, in the second coming. But for God, all things are one. It's like a seamless garment. And just as we say that um, when Jesus went to be crucified, he had a seamless garment that was taken off and then it was divided up, so to say. God's vantage point is like the seamless garments. Everything is interconnected, interwoven. There's a unity to it all. From our vantage point, we see it as all 
uh, spliced, you know. We see it as all different frames. But he sees the whole picture in the same instant. And so to underscore this point, this deep point, we present one season of Advent. There are not multiple seasons of Advent. There is simply one season of Advent. And for our human need, we might uh, distinguish between the first part and the second part of Advent, between a focus on the second coming and then shifting to a focus on the first coming. But notice, symbolically, there's only one season of Advent, even if for a human need, we have two different focuses during the season of Advent. It's meant to emphasize how to God all things are one, and that he is present as much to the first coming as he is to the second coming, even though from our vantage point, the first coming is in the past and the second coming is in the future. So remember, the first portion of Advent is fixated on the second coming. Obviously, there are allusions to the first coming throughout all the prayers, but like I said, the focus is on the second coming. Because that is a part of the one seamless garments of how the Lord makes his adventum to us, his coming, his advent to us. Now, in the second portion of Advent, you'll notice I keep on referring to this, this date, December 17th. Well, the second portion of Advent begins from this uh, December 17th onward. The reason for that is because of the number seven. Seven days is in the biblical mindset uh, a depiction of a perfect week. If the week had six days, it would be incomplete, it would be imperfect. But seven is the symbol of completeness, perfection. And so for the final seven days before Christmas, we perfectly situate ourselves by the number seven into the state of preparedness as we commemorate the first coming of Jesus. So from the 17th to the 24th, those seven days, we perfectly prepare to commemorate the first coming. And during each of these days, um, at Mass, the famous O Antiphons will be chanted. So, you know of this already in a certain sense, because you might be thinking to yourself, well, what's an O Antiphon? Well, you know, you've heard of these in some way. The, the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel are a compilation of the seven O antiphons that are chanted during the seven masses of the seven days leading up to Christmas Day. From the 17th to the 24th, each mass has its own special antiphon during the um, reading of the gospel. And it begins by the phrase, oh, it's an acclamation. So, for instance, December 17th, the first of the seven days, begins with the acclamation, oh, wisdom, oh, holy word of God, you govern all creation and you with your strong yet tender care, come and show your people the way to salvation. And December 18th, just, and I'll stop there for the sake of simplicity, oh, sacred Lord of ancient Israel, who showed yourself to Moses in the burning bush, who gave him the holy law on Sinai mountain, come, stretch out your mighty hand to set us free. They're called the O Antiphons because we, they begin with the vocative acclamation O. O Wisdom. O Sacred Lord of ancient Israel. And then it goes on and on, right? Well, these antiphons are really important because they're meant to put us in the mindset of preparing for Christmas. And the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the verses of it correspond more or less to these antiphons. 
So like I said, in a certain sense, you're already familiar with the O antiphons, but you've been exposed to them in the form of the Him O Come O Come Emmanuel. The verses after the first verse, O Come O Come Emmanuel, all those mirror the O antiphons. But the reason why we have these is because, like I said, they're meant to put us in this attitude of preparation. They're meant to show us that the incarnation is not out of the blue, but rather the culmination of God's intimacy with Israel for thousands of years. You may have heard me say in other podcasts or even in a homily, or maybe in the Thursday night talks that I give once a month, that Jesus in the Old Testament was known as wis the wisdom of God or as the angel of the Lord. You see, Lady Wisdom in the Old Testament is described almost in the same terms as we describe Jesus in the New Testament. And the angel of the Lord, this appearance of God's glory and presence to various people in the Old Testament, after encountering this figure, they'll say, I've seen God face to face. This figure appears time and time again. Just as, and, it, and it's described just as Jesus is in the New Testament. And for this reason, the ancient fathers of the church, the ancient bishops, would describe wisdom in the Old Testament and the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, in, sorry, Old Testament, as being pre-incarnate appearances of the Son of God. So you'll notice in these uh, antiphons, you'll hear references to how Jesus is God's wisdom. That's in the first antiphon of December 17th. Oh, wisdom, O oh, holy word of God. Or in the second antiphon on December 18th. O oh, sacred Lord of ancient Israel, who showed yourself to Moses in the burning bush. Well, actually, if you look at Exodus chapter 3, it says that the angel of the Lord manifested himself in the burning bush. But because the ancient fathers realized that the angel of the Lord is the very presence of the Son of God, they say in their wisdom here in this antiphon that you, Jesus, you, Lord, showed yourself to Moses in the burning bush. So the moral of this story is that whether as wisdom, the angel of the Lord, any other form of manifestation, Jesus, as the Son of God, was taking form, a given form from time to time in the Old Testament. He was always appearing and drawing close to his people. The incarnation, then, is not a new thing. It's new in the sense that he is permanently becoming man. He's becoming one of us once for all and experiencing everything that we have and are. But his affinity to us and his taking an appearance is not new. That has always been happening. So the perfect way to prepare for the coming of Jesus, according to the season of Advent, is to turn our attention to those moments in which he appeared gradually in the Old Testament as the sign that he would finally take flesh in the fullest sense of the term in the Incarnation. So, as we journey through Advent, let's keep these two things in mind. First and foremost, that there is one season of Advent, in, even as from God's vantage point, there is one coming. There is one way in which he draws near to humanity. It's a seamless garment. Although from our vantage point, we see it as frames in a picture or in a video. And so from our vantage point, we have to shift from the second coming to the first coming. Still, there is a unity and that's why we don't have two seasons of Advent, one focus on the second coming and then a separate focus on the first, but rather one season of Advent, one season commemorating the coming of the Lord. So that's the first point. And then the second point is that 
during the last seven days of Advent, from the 17th to the 24th, we turn our attention to a perfect preparation of the coming of Jesus, or commemorating the first coming of Jesus. And we do so by recognizing that he was always manifesting his presence. It's just that in these last days, he has fully identified himself with everything we have and are by becoming man. And so for our spiritual preparation, I encourage everybody to look at these O antiphons. It's the gospel antiphon for the 17th through the 24th. Look at these, meditate upon these. Just like Mary meditated upon everything in her heart, meditate on these things and cherish these in your heart and enter into the season. The season of the second coming and the season of the first coming. And as we do so, we'll notice, and I'll close with this point, we'll notice that the clergy will wear specific kinds of vestments. We will wear purple vestments for most of Advent and purple in the ancient context is the color of royalty. That's why sometimes you might hear a reference to the phrase, the royal purple. Well, purple, once again, from an ancient vantage point, was a regal color. It was used only for royalty. And so by wearing purple during this season, we are saying two things. One, we are awaiting the coming of the great king and commemorating the first coming of that king. But also by wearing purple, what we're saying to God's people is that in Christ we have all been consecrated as priest, prophet, and king. We have all been consecrated and given a royal identity in Christ. And so when the priest and the deacon wear the royal chasuble or the, um, the purple chasuble and the purple dalmatic, they are saying to God's people that all of us have been identified as royalty in Christ. God reigns in us and we are destined to be caught up in, to God's throne in glory. And so although at a visible level, the sacred ministers, i.e. The, the presbyter and the deacon will wear purple garments, the symbol of royalty, they're not wearing them just for themselves. They're wearing them to be a sign to all of us that we all have this interior royal identity in Christ. Our soul is clothed with a royal purple. So see in that a sign of your dignity. Also, it's important to note that the third Sunday of Advent is one of the two Sundays of the year in which we wear rose. Uh, I know we all will joke and say it's pink, but it's technically rose. Why? Because rose is the color of joy. Rose is the color of joy. Why? Because when you take violet and you um, and you lighten the shade of violet, it becomes rose. Well, as a symbol of joy, as we are about to anticipate the coming of the king, on the third Sunday of Advent, we rejoice. It's a reminder to us that he's almost here. And so in the liturgical tradition of the church, for the four Sundays of Advent, the first, second, and fourth, as well as all the days of the week, they wear purple. We wear purple vestments as well as for the days of the third week of Advent. But for the third Sunday of Advent, as we're about to draw near, we wear a lighter shade of the violet. We wear rose. And we have a beautiful set of rose vestments now. So I hope you uh, are, um, you know, you see the joy signified in them. But I want you to note that we have these two colors to signify royalty and joy. Purple signifies royalty. 
The rose signifies joy as we're drawing near to Christmas. And the royal purple isn't only describing the king who is coming, both again in glory and as we commemorate the first coming, but it's also meant to describe how we have been given a royal dignity in him. So seeing these things a sign of your dignity, a sign of how we are to be joyful. So may you continue to have a blessed season of Advent and a peaceful day. Peace.